If you hold up your Bible and let it kind of fall, it'll probably fall to John 14, 15, and 16. <laughs> and that's where we'll be looking at is John chapter 15. And we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Now before we got to John chapter 14, well, let me say, I want... I want you to know that when we read the text, that this is what I want to say. A lot of times, I, it, you just get the impression you read the text to kind of get that out of the way so that you can say what you want to say. But I want to tell you the text is what I want to say. Yeah. That's what I want to say. Amen. Now before Jesus came to this, we come to John 15 and John chapter 12, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So this was Jesus' plan. To die and bring forth much fruit. So we have Christ crucified. Our starting point is Jesus Christ, crucified. Amen. Amen. So this corn of wheat did fall to the ground, and this corn of wheat did die, and it sprang up, and it is a vine. So John chapter 15, starting at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So in this way, you will show that you're my disciples. You've borne fruit. Is this a little too technical for everyone? <laughs> the vine and the branches. If you're in the vine, you bear fruit. If you're not in the vine, you do not bear fruit. And so the main thing is abiding. Abiding in the vine. You know, the source of the fruit is the vine. It all, all the life comes from the vine. If you're separate from the vine, you have no life. It's such a simple and beautiful picture and illustrates so well what I want to talk about in the fruit of the Spirit. So how do we know if we have the Holy Spirit? What does He do when He's in you? If you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you will be changed. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you will go to hell. Amen. If any men have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit is the result of a relationship with the Father and the Son through the Spirit. Just as children are the fruit of a love relationship between husband and wife, the result of being united with Christ through the Spirit is that we bear the Spirit's fruit. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. 
So we're going to come back to this again and again. It is relationship that produces fruit. Abiding in the vine. The fruit is altogether different from our best righteousnesses without the Spirit. Amen. Filthy rags. There is a fundamental change in our nature which always produces dramatic changes in how we live. Amen. Apart from this change, there is no evidence of salvation. I'm afraid that the church of this day needs to hear this message. Now let, let's look at the purpose of God. Now the, the purpose of a branch is to bear fruit. Right? God's purpose has been to bless people with fruitfulness. When he made Adam and Eve, he made them in his likeness. And God blessed them... And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So the means of subduing the earth was to be fruitful. And that's how we'll, we will subdue the earth is by being fruitful. Amen. Being fruitful is what God had promised to Abraham in the new covenant. He said, I will make thee exceeding fruitful. God said, I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed, that's Christ, after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto them. That's a relationship. The fruit comes from the relationship with God. Amen. Now notice that fruitfulness was the blessing of God. God blessed Abraham to be fruitful. In other words, he would not be fruitful without God blessing him. Amen. The fruit would not have been produced without God's direct involvement. Now when Isaiah prophesied that when the Spirit would be poured upon us from on high, the wilderness would be a fruitful field. Amen. And the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Amen. He said, Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forevermore. Amen. Now notice that the immediate result of God's Spirit poured upon His people is fruitfulness. It is a fruitfulness characterized by judgment and righteousness. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Amen. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit does. We're talking about heavenly produce. Amen. This is what the Spirit produces. Yeah. The work and effect of righteousness are the fruit of the Spirit. Eternal peace and quietness. Forever. And assurance. Now let's think about God's purpose. What was his purpose in creation? We know that the redemption of man was on the agenda from the start. Amen. So God purposed to save man before he created him. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, what was his purpose in saving us? I mean, what, what purpose did he have for us when he saved us? The scripture describes a twofold purpose. One is that Christ might bring us to God. This, re this reveals God's desire for relationship with us. The other purpose is that he would conform us to the image of his son. This reveals God's desire to change us. Now, actually, the relationship could never come to be without the change because God is holy. Amen. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil Amen. and canst not look on iniquity. And the change could never happen 
without the relationship. Because it is God that worketh in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Thank God for that. God doesn't work this change in strangers. If you are far from God, you will not bear fruit. Amen. Or the, the better way to look at it is if you're not bearing fruit, you better see how your relationship with God. And that's the main point I want to make today. Now the change, we're talking about the purpose of God, relationship and change. If you look at all the scriptures that talk about God's purpose in saving us, you can kind of categorize them in these categories. The change is inward and outward. It is first inward and then it is outward. Amen. Let's look at some of the scriptures. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify into himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Amen. That's a change. We weren't zealous of good works before. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see what it takes to be Jesus' brother? Amen. You have to be conformed to his image. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's why our new man was created. The new creation is for good works. Which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father. And he saved us and called us with a holy calling. It's a holy calling that you've received. Wherefore, Christ, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, yes. suffered without the gate. Now, Ephesians 5, he said that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might, for this purpose, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, that's the change, with the washing of water of the word, that he might present it to himself, that's the relationship. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Amen. But that it should be holy and without blame. That's kind of a foreign concept today, as being without blame. Therefore, God's purpose was to reconcile us to himself and change us to be like himself. The change has to do with who we have become first, and then with what we do. What we do is the evidence of this reconciliation we have with God. Amen. That is fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. This glorifies the Father. Amen. Now notice in our text that God requires fruit. He does. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. John the Baptist said, The axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Amen. Yes. Jesus spoke a parable that a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seek, seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down! Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. 
we see here Jesus, or I don't know, maybe it's, this is the Holy Spirit, but Jesus as the intercessor and advocate, even for a barren tree, for a time, for a time. And there comes a day when the time runs out, when that fourth year is ended, if you have not borne fruit, cut it down. It's useless. This is the purpose we were created, that we would bear fruit. That which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. You see all the work that is being resisted in order to remain unfruitful? If you will persist in unfruitfulness, you see, you're resisting God's work. The work of the Holy Spirit. He's digging and dunging. He's providing every opportunity to bear fruit. Everything you need to bear fruit is there. God is working to make you fruitful. You see what a serious thing it is to resist that. Jesus saw the fig tree in the way. He came to it. Found nothing thereon. But leaves only. He said unto it. Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. God requires fruit. That's what he's looking for. Yes. Amen. Jesus spoke another parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a place for, a wine, for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And at the season, he sent to the husbandmen of the servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. God is looking for fruit. He's coming and seeking fruit. Amen. He might be looking for fruit right here today, right in this room. He's looking around for fruit. Amen. Thank God when we can give, the, give Him the fruit of the vineyard. Yes. Thank God when our spirit bears witness that that fruit is wrought of God. So then the purpose of the branches is to bear fruit. And God requires fruit. So how does he accomplish his purpose in us? To make us fruitful. Remember God said, I will make thee fruitful. If you open your Bible and let it fall this way a little, you probably go to Ezekiel 36. Or Ezekiel 11. Where we have the promise of a new covenant. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. Amen. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my ways. Walk in my statutes. That's the change. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And ye shall be my people. And I will be your God. That's the relationship. The infusing of God's spirit accomplishes what the law was impotent to do. Amen. It actually brings about the keeping of God's statutes and judgments. We are made to walk in a manner consistent with God's holiness and pleasing to Him. Amen. It does this by taking away the rebellion, that stony heart, and creating a relationship. Ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Amen. God is saying, this is what you need. You need me. Yes. Amen. What the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh... God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. That's the purpose. 
Now notice this. In Ezekiel 36 there, when God puts his spirit in someone, it is not just a gift. It is an exchange. Amen. Yes. He takes away the stony heart. Otherwise, it would be like putting new wine in old bottles. The new wine must be put into new bottles. And so when he gives you his spirit, he takes away the stony heart. And he gives you a heart of flesh. So we have putting and taking involved. Putting and taking. A new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Has he taken the stony heart from you? That, that part that resists God? Now the giving of the Spirit of God accomplishes God's purpose to make us fruitful. Bezalel. I had puzzled about this. He was, God called him by name, you know. The Lord spake to Moses and said, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. Do you know what Bezalel was doing? He was preparing a habitation of God Amen. through the Spirit. Amen. It dawned on me. This is what he was doing. This is uh, Why did God make such a big deal about putting his Spirit on him for such an apparent carnal work? Well, he was preparing the tabernacle of God to be a dwelling place of God. Now, he, he's instructing us here in the work of the Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit to prepare us. We're building together in habitation of God through the Spirit. That's Ephesians 2.22. So this is the Spirit's work. To prepare us so God can dwell in us. Notice that the Spirit's work involves cutting and carving Amen. to make something useful and precious out of something useless. Sometimes the Spirit's work is painful. But that's what it takes, so praise God. Amen. Now the Spirit of God dwelling in man brings about fundamental change. You just think of the fruit of the Spirit. These are not outward things. These are fundamental changes of character. This is not you get the Spirit and you speak in tongues and go and live how you want to live. These are deep changes. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. A fundamental change. You know, Jude, he was a little bit judgmental. But he saw some people, and he, he talked about those who were, who were spots in your feast of charity. Feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. Carried about by winds. Trees whose fruit withereth. Without fruit. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. They had fruit and it withered. And now they have no fruit. And he went on a little further and he said, How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own God, ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual. And he said, They don't have the spirit. He said, They don't have fruit. They don't have the Spirit. They were judging by fruit. If they had the Spirit, it would bring about fundamental change in their life. And they wouldn't be like this. 
The law could no law could produce this fruit. Against such there is no law. The miraculous working of the Spirit of God in a man's life accomplishes fundamental changes which could not be brought about by mere discipline. Amen. Otherwise it would be your fruit. It's the Spirit's fruit. The scripture talks about this change the Spirit works in us. We all with open face beholding us in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Amen. The prayer for the Ephesians was that they might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That is the function of the spirit. To strengthen us, to change us, to produce fruit in us. This is not merely outward appearance, it's fundamental change. The indwelling spirit brings a new moral fiber or backbone to a person. Amen. A new ethical strength and integrity and fortitude which previously did not and could not exist Amen. without God's spirit. It is the exclusive work of the spirit. It is spiritual fruit and not carnal. There is a serious moral decay in the modern church. It should make us weep. Yes. Amen. I don't know if you, I'm sure you've all heard these phrases like, please be patient with me. God's not finished with me yet. Or Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And I, I understand, in a sense, what they're saying. I know that I've not already attained or already been made perfect. But I can't help but get the impression that they're saying, don't expect more from a Christian. I can't help get, get that impression that they're trying to tell the world, don't expect better behavior of Christians, we're just forgiven. Should Christians be held to a higher moral standard or are they just forgiven? You know, when Paul, he wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much insurance. As ye know what manner of men we were among you. For your sake. He said, you knew how we lived. And he later he said, ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among them, among you that believe. Amen. He, that's what he said. He said, judge my message by how I live. Yes. Amen. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. See, the devil's trying to get us to accept a mediocre form of Christianity. One that does not have fundamental change involved. What happened to ye shall receive power? After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We are to judge by fruit. God judges by fruit. The wind bloweth where it listeth. You hear the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit of God. It's born of the Spirit. Here we are technical again. Is it windy outside? Yes. Well, how do you know? Well, I saw it. Did you see the wind? Well, no. I... I saw the leaves blowing. Oh, you saw the effect of the wind. How did you know the wind was blowing? You heard it. You saw the effect. You didn't see the wind. So is everyone born of the Spirit. You know they're born of the Spirit by how they live. 
Praise God. Fruit is an infallible means of judging. Ye shall know them by their fruits, Jesus said. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Is this too technical again? A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Amen. Fruit doesn't lie. I mean, observed consistently, uh, it doesn't lie. The fruit we bear is the indisputable evidence of who we are. It demonstrates the validity of the relationship. Amen. So fruit is a test of relationship. If you're bearing fruit, I know that you're attached to the vine. Or I should say it this way, if I'm bearing fruit, I know that I'm in the vine. And if I'm not, I better look. Amen. Bearing fruit doesn't qualify you to be in the vine. It shows that you already are. Amen. The lack of fruit shows that you are not. Now, fruit born of, by the Spirit is all of the same nature. Yes. It's all righteous. Amen. All the fruit of the Spirit is righteous. It's goodness, righteousness, and truth. When we are grafted into the vine, we take on the nature or character of the vine. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we are, we're all bearing the fruit that makes us like Jesus. Now I want you to notice that it is the Spirit's fruit. And if it is the Spirit's fruit, we can have no love, joy, peace, and these things without the Spirit. These things produced by the Spirit are altogether different from anything man can generate. Amen. It is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. It's God's, it's the fruit of the Spirit. And when the, the apostles were going to speak, Jesus said, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Amen. It's the Spirit speaking. Now if you're preaching, and you're the main attraction, it's not the Spirit speaking. Amen. Amen. But if you're preaching, and the message is the main attraction, it's the Spirit speaking. Amen. Praise God, you can bear fruit. Now the Spirit gives life to the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. And that's what we need. We need some life in the body of Christ. This is how Christ interacts with the world now, through His body. That's us. So the Spirit gives that life. The, body without, the Spirit is dead. So faith without works is dead. Now I want to think for a minute about the blessed and desirable nature of the fruit of the Spirit. Just think about love, joy, peace. God has, by His Spirit, revealed the things that He has prepared for them that love Him. Things the natural man cannot even imagine. This is why we receive the Spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He's given you the Spirit so you know how great the things of God are that He's given to you. Now love, joy, and peace. In addition to new moral strength, the Spirit's fruit consists in delightful and longed for emotional heights. Joy, peace, love. While not merely emotional, they do bring a state of rest which produces emotions. Satisfying the deepest longings that are within man. Amen. Isn't that what everybody wants? Amen. Love, joy, and peace. Thank you, God, for giving us the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Now, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, these are deep character changes which make us immune to life's stormy circumstances. They actually make us more like Christ. Yes. Amen. 
So what is the nature of this fruit bearing? If it is the Spirit's fruit, is it automatically produced in those with the Spirit? Well, ultimately, and in the ultimate sense, you can look at someone who's born fruit in their life and say that they had the Spirit. And someone who is not born fruit, and you can say they did not have the Spirit. But how could someone be in the vine and not bear fruit? That's what Jesus said. He said, every branch in me that beareth not fruit. The problem was that that branch wasn't abiding in him, he said later in verse 6 of our text. Now I want us to know most assuredly that we must do it or it will not be done. We must bear the fruit. Galatians 5 is an admonition to walk in the Spirit and thus operate in His fruit. He's saying do not respond to the desires of the flesh and so participate in the works of the flesh. Rather respond to the desires of the Spirit and bear His fruit. The desires of the Spirit. So you, I know that you know that the flesh lusts against the spirit, but did you know the spirit lusteth against the flesh? Amen. 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 My spirit doesn't want to sin. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Thank God for that competing desire within us. Amen. And so bearing fruit is a matter of responding. Amen. This is how we bear fruit. We respond to the desires of the spirit instead of the desires of the flesh. And Galatians 5, is it's an admonition. It's written to remind us. If, you walk in this, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So we have to know that. We have to know that, and we have to respond to that desire. So th this is our role, that we do it. Now the Spirit's role in bearing fruit. He provides the power. It is the Spirit's fruit. It is not born apart from the Spirit. It cannot be born without the Spirit. You can fake it, but you can't truly bear the fruit of the Spirit without the Spirit. Yes. Strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. He does not usurp our will or overpower us. See, this is not like demon possession. See, the Spirit just comes on and overpowers your will. No, the, the ministry of the Spirit is like, it is described uh, in, the, in John chapter 14 when he said, the Comforter will come. And he said, he shall teach you of all things and bring all things to your remembrance Whatsoever I've said unto you. It's teaching and reminding. This is the ministry of the Spirit. He teaches us and reminds us of the truth. So this is a ministry of appealing to our new man. Amen. Yes. Hey, I live here. That's what the Spirit's saying. Paul reasoned like this. He said, know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? We're appealing to the new man and saying, consider this. The, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. How are you going to take that body and sin with it? The Holy Spirit's role is like a fire shut up in the bones. That's why he said, quench not the Spirit. The Spirit's a fire. Fire that is giving us that desire to please the Father. Now the joint role, our role and the, and the Spirit's role, and the joint role is that if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, of the body, ye shall live. Seeing ye have purified your soul and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. You know, he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought of God. Amen. He does the truth. 
He comes to show you that God did it. Amen. Amen. Now we've read that the spirit and the bride say come. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Amen. Now this, the bride's saying come too. Amen. The bride has joined with the spirit in bidding men to come. This is surely the fruit of the spirit born in the church. Amen. How then do we bear fruit or live right? Is it through education? If I'm taught what is right, will then that then make me do what is right? Is it through self-discipline? If I try hard enough, will I then be able to live right? Or is it by holding pure doctrine? And now we've come to the top of the mountain. I want to look back and see what everything hangs upon. Everything is founded upon relationship with God. The fruit is only born by intimate connection with the vine. Amen. Partaking of the root and fatness. Mm -hmm. It is relationship. It is interaction with God. Amen. We're receiving nutrients from Him. Romans chapter 7. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that he should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. You're married to Christ. See, we had, we had a previous marriage that wasn't a very good one. And there was, there was no way out. You can't divorce the law. The only way out was to die. But the purpose of dying to the law was not to be under another law. It was to be married to Christ. Amen. It was that relationship and fellowship that characterizes the new covenant relationship. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Amen. See, the relationship is what produces the fruit. In Galatians 5, walking in the spirit is contrasted with law keeping. Mm -hmm. Upright living is not accomplished by commandments, but by a relationship. This intimate relationship of a yielded man with the Spirit of God produces more discipline, holy zeal, self-denial than any law could do. Amen. Just as children are the fruit of an intimate love relationship between a man and woman, so the fruit of Spirit is born by our union with God through His Spirit. Amen. This is why genuine fruit cannot be created in someone who is alienated from God. Amen. So, it doesn't do any good to clean up your life unless you're brought to God. Yes. It doesn't do any good to go to the church meeting if you don't come to God. Relationship is the answer to lack of fruit. Remember Jesus said to the church that was lukewarm, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. He said, what you need, you're lacking fruit and what you need is me. Amen. If you're lacking fruit, what you need is Jesus. Amen. Have you left your first love? Have you gone about your religious activity and all your church activities and left that first love you had for Christ? I know it's easy to do, but let's be reminded today. That's the main thing, yes. knowing God. Amen. When we have this love relationship, temptations lose their power. That's why walking in the Spirit, you not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
Listen to these, uh, these proclamations of Scripture. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Amen. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Since fruit is a result of a relationship, it means that you can't do it by yourself. It means that you can't fake it. And it means that it's not of works. But the fruit of the Spirit is that glorious result and, and benefit of being close with Jesus and loving Him. I want this to go beyond teaching. I feel that I, I need to be very direct about this. Will we just learn of Christ and not fellowship with Him? Will we learn about His Spirit and not fellowship with Him? Well, brethren, God has done everything that's required to make us fruitful. He's given us all things that we need to be fruitful. And if you will just give yourself to Him, maybe you've never had that stony heart removed. Maybe there's still that resistance to what God wants to do. Give Him the stony heart. Let Him put His Spirit within you and produce the fruit of the Spirit. Is God a stranger to you? Praise God. I'm convinced of better things of you, brethren. But I don't know. Maybe there is someone here whose heart is strayed from the Lord. Now you look at the fruit. I want you to think for a minute about the fruit of your life. And that will tell you to look back at the relationship. So if you're bearing fruit, I want to thank God for it. I want to thank God that He produced it in you, that it's wrought of God.